Today's video is brought to you by Manscaped. Stick around to learn more about their awesome products coming up. Stranded, alone, and fighting to survive. It's those three simple ideas that have laid the foundation for some of the best survival games of the modern era. But what happens when you take that formula and infuse just a hint of magic? Hey there friends, it's Kodiak here. Welcome back to Legacy Gaming. Today, we have the special privilege of working alongside the incredible developers at Inflexion Games to bring you our ultimate preview for their upcoming survival game, Nightingale. To kick this thing off, let me just say, this is one of the most exciting Ultimate Previews we've ever done on the channel. Instead of latching onto every news article and interview, we decided to change it up and go right to the source, the developers. This video will be filled to the brim with everything you need to know about the game, the basics, all the way up to exclusive new information, confirmations, and images never revealed to the public. But before we get to all of that, we do need to cover the basics. What is Nightingale? The game is coined as a shared world survival game. Your character, known as a Realm Walker, is stranded after a cataclysmic event takes down a series of magical portals that connected various realms. In true survival fashion, it's now up to you to chop, hunt, and scavenge across whatever world you're stranded on, and find a way to activate portals scattered across the realms to reach the fabled magic city of Nightingale. As you can see, at its core, Nightingale is a survival game, but this isn't Rust. Don't expect to run bare-ass naked across some random beach. No, Nightingale has a bit more class than that. What I'm really getting at is the setting and themes the game is built upon. Nightingale takes place in an alternate historical timeline set in the late 1800s, the Victorian era. One look at any of the characters and you can see the influence. Couple that with the game's sub-theme, Gaslamp Fantasy, well then, you've got a pretty interesting backdrop to build a game around. If you're unfamiliar with Gaslamp Fantasy, that's okay. I was too until recently. What we're talking about is a darker fantasy world, one that's built upon the gothic and romantic themes that came before. The idea is to create a sense of uneasiness and foreboding. That's a hallmark of the genre. And if you take one look at this creature here, you'll start to get a sense of what I'm talking about. I tell you all this because it's an important backdrop to understanding the rest of the game, most importantly, the world. Survival games don't often have truly memorable worlds. Sure, they're interesting enough, but the team at Nightingale really hopes to change the dynamic and create a world that players remember. As I mentioned in the intro, you play as a realm walker, stranded after a cataclysmic event. However, where you're stranded is going to vary, and that's where the world building starts to take shape. Your goal is to reach Nightingale, a magical city and the last bastion of human ingenuity, but along the way you'll have to survive across a number of different realms, each with their own landmarks, resources, and enemies. Types of realms that we know of include a desert at the edge of an ocean, a lush tropical jungle filled with murky swamps, and a dense forest. Each realm offers players different challenges, and as the game evolves over time, I have no doubt more varieties of realms will be implemented. The realms are all connected by a series of portals, powered by arcane magic. Your job is to survive long enough to reactivate the portals and reach the next realm, one step closer to Nightingale. One of the newest bits of information revealed by the team actually sheds some light on how the portals will function. Using a combination of materials, players will create realm cards. Depending on the combination of materials players use, their realm card will take them to a different world. Each realm card acts as a sort of modifier, meaning players can influence the environment, weather, creatures, resources, and more within each realm. For those curious, realms are procedurally generated, but each realm does have assets associated with it. You won't see the same thing in every single realm, but there will be a loose set of rules that guide what you could potentially see. If the developers nail this aspect, it could keep the game really interesting long term, as the sheer variety of the unknown would keep players on their toes. I also learned that players will be able to set respite realms, which will allow the realm walkers to keep exploring the various worlds while setting a sort of home base that they can go back to. Sadly, there's no word on how many combinations of worlds will be in the game during early access launch, but my guess is there will be plenty of variety to give players a taste of the total breadth of the game. The modular approach to Nightingale is just one of the reasons why we have faith in the game long term. As more content is developed, it makes perfect sense to introduce new realms, resources, enemies, items, and more, and offers the perfect avenue to keep expanding Nightingale overall. 
I think it's also important to talk about Nightingale itself. Reaching this magical city is the goal of the game, but the developers have said this isn't the end of the game. What you need to know about the city of Nightingale right now is that it won't be available for players to find when the game launches into early access, but it is a pinnacle part of the gameplay experience. Remember, this is where the secrets of arcane magic revealed by the Fae in the 1500s were harnessed and used to perfect and advance the fields of science and manufacturing. I wish I could tell you more, I really do, but as you can imagine, this is a closely guarded developer secret. Today's video is brought to you by Manscaped. Look, bottom line, you gotta keep yourself fresh, and whether it's your face, arms, pits, wherever, our friends at Manscaped have you covered with everything from shavers and trimmers to soaps and shampoos. These guys are truly leading the way when it comes to men's hygiene. They sent me their Performance Package 4.0, and let me tell you, this thing is changing the game. You've got the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. This thing feels good in the hand, cuts the hairs nice and clean, and it's small, but mighty. You can also throw this thing in a bag, and boom, you've got your trimmer wherever you need it. You also get the Weed Whacker, which is great for cleaning up in the nose and around the ear. Guys, do yourself a favor, use the code LEGACY20 to save 20% off at manscaped.com. Pick yourself up some trimmers, some deodorant, shampoo, no matter what you're looking for, check out Manscaped and get the right tool for the right job. So we've got the setting, we've got the world, it's time to talk about the gameplay and systems that will power Nightingale. This is a survival game, through and through, but there's a lot more to the foundation of Nightingale than just chopping down trees and scavenging for berries. Yes, you have a health bar, and sure, hunger is a thing, and you'll even need to fend off the extreme elements, but it goes beyond that. If you've been following the game for any extended period of time, you might have heard that Nightingale was going to be an MMO survival game, with potentially thousands of players inhabiting a single map. Well, that's no longer the case. As of right now, the team is focused on developing this concept of a shared world that can support solo players all the way up to groups of between 6 and 10. The developer's goal, as we understand it right now, is that the game will start off as a relatively intimate, invite-only co-op experience. Over time, their intention is to build out more shared world functionality after the game goes into early access. What that means and how that involves connecting other players together remains to be seen. I think this is the right time to lay a hard truth on you all. There are no plans at the present to introduce PvP mechanics. This may be an immediate deal breaker for some, but for others like myself that enjoy the thrill of working together against a common enemy, this is an exciting change to what we've come to expect from the genre. With that in mind, if you've seen the Nightingale trailers, you already know there is no shortage of frightening creatures looking to hunt you down in the dark. Each realm will have their own unique array of enemies, some of which include the Bound, a group of humanoids twisted and now mad, Harpies, carnivorous serpentine creatures with frighteningly human faces, and the Bandersnatch, a creature inspired by a Lewis Carroll novel that prowls the realms on two legs. There will also be something called Apex Creatures, bosses if you will, that will present an even bigger challenge for players. Three Apex Creatures we know of are Ishmael, a massive beast found in the Swamp Realm, a clockwork automaton with four arms, and a giant at the service of the Fae. These apex creatures represent the toughest combat challenges a player will have to face, but there's depth here that you don't often find in other survival games. We actually got a glimpse of this ever so slightly in the first Nightingale trailer. The team has said that choice is going to be a factor in as much of the game as possible, giving players options with how they want to deal with certain situations. Choice is a word a lot of developers throw out there ahead of a game's launch, so I asked the team to expand on this even more so players had a realistic understanding of how it could work in Nightingale, to which they said, specific moments of choice have been scattered throughout the world as a way to bring depth and variety to the experience, adding more dimension to the survival crafting gameplay at the core of Nightingale. Choice was showcased in the announcement trailer. The giant, one of the game's apex creatures, demonstrates the dichotomy that the world will present. On the one hand, the peaceful scenario. The Realm Walkers are making an offering to the giant to receive a reward, a specific item that they'll need to continue their journey. However, you also see the giant rampaging through the community structures that they've built, and players are able to try and defeat the giant in combat. What's interesting is that the giant may have pursued those realm walkers to that particular structure after an altercation elsewhere. As far as I understand it, choice seems like more of an end game system, something you experience once you've established yourself in the world. And since we're talking about a survival game, I think it's important we really drill down on those first few hours within the game, what you as a player can expect. I really wanted to get a sense of this from the developers and ask them point blank, what are those first hours going to be like? To which they said, we want those first moments to be really evocative, immersing players in the immediate danger and intrigue of the otherworldly environment they find themselves thrown into. 
As the game starts, the portal network has just collapsed, and your Realm Walker has been thrown into this mysterious and dangerous new scenario. So what we want to do is instill a sense of urgency and danger, but also allow the beauty of the Feywild world to be explored. After talking to the team, it's pretty clear a traditional survival experience will be central to the beginning parts of the game. Players will need to harvest resources, craft a shelter, and start working on those tools and materials they need to progress. This is all in an effort to establish a footing as players work to open the collapsed portal network. One new survival system the developers are excited about is Hope. As a wayward adventurer looking to find your way back home, it makes complete sense that hope would be a driving factor. By completing certain things in the world, your hope meter goes up. By doing bad things and by bad things happening to you, that hope meter goes down. As you can imagine, I wanted to know more about how this tied into the gameplay, so I asked the developers. Hope is a survival meter that players have to manage alongside health, hunger, and stamina. The goal with Hope is to bring a psychological element to survival systems in this type of game. How do your actions impact your ability to survive in the realms beyond just being fed or warm, etc.? With Hope, if you do something positive, such as build a home for yourself, you'll see that your Hope meter will go up, and with that, you'll receive buffs that benefit survival and exploration. However, if an invading giant tramples on your newly built homestead, you'll see your hope meter drop and that will have a negative impact on your attributes. A good way to think about the hope meter is if you imagine you're playing a game set underwater and you have an oxygen meter. Initially, you may not be able to venture too deep as things get more dangerous the further you explore, but as you progress, you're able to upgrade your oxygen tank, which allows you to go further and further, increasing your ability to reach new areas and make greater discoveries. The hope meter in Nightingale has a similar function. Some realms will more negatively impact your hope and will make it difficult to explore without draining the meter. However, by building out your estate and crafting certain gear and performing other activities, you'll greatly increase your ability to manage your hope meter, allowing you to be able to explore more challenging realms. Managing your hope is intended to be a more strategic survival bar. What's really fascinating about Nightingale is the genre-bending approach the team is taking to some of the core systems. For those that didn't know, Inflexion Games CEO Aaron Flynn has an extensive RPG background, helping usher in some critically acclaimed games during his tenure with BioWare. But the studio, Inflexion, is filled with veterans from around the industry, which is why Nightingale presents itself with some bold new ideas. One clear example of this is the introduction of NPCs, quests, and deep character development, three things we know are important to the team. The team has already revealed they're tapping into this concept of an alternate history and bringing in 19th century characters to help establish the world. Two such characters we know about are Nellie Bly, an American journalist made famous for her trip around the world in 72 days, and Marie Curie, the world-renowned physicist whose pioneering work on radioactivity changed the world forever. Both women will be NPCs within the world of Nightingale at some point. They'll offer advice, have quests for players to complete, and are just two of the many characters we'll no doubt meet along the way as we attempt to reach Nightingale. According to the developers, some of these NPCs will also eventually be recruitable and will join players in their adventures, potentially helping them fight, hunt, build, and survive. According to our sources within the studio, this is something that'll happen throughout the game's development, not a feature that will be available right at early access launch. What I think it's important to remember is that Nightingale isn't an RPG. It's a survival game that's pulling classic systems from RPGs into a new space in an attempt to make them work in a completely new way. If you go into the game expecting Dragon Age, well, you'll be in for a bit of a letdown as Nightingale is attempting to do something completely different. That being said, with Flynn at the helm of the studio and a number of industry vets with extensive RPG experience, I think it's safe to say we'll see a number of those systems come into play during our time with the game. One thing synonymous with nearly every survival game is crafting and building. We all know the process. We collect resources, build tools, use those tools to get better resources, and create better items and structures. It's a cycle that can continue on endlessly, so how is the Inflexium team looking to make these systems unique in Nightingale? At least at a foundational level, we know two things. That players will unlock blueprints, which give them access to new structures, and that the goal is freedom to create, establishing a deep and versatile system for players to explore. Sadly, the team is keeping these cards a bit close to the chest on the matter, but promise more details will come before the end of the year. One thing we can talk about is the reason why you would even need an estate, the fancy word the devs are using for bases, in the first place. Of course, there is the creative side of things, and the developers have said that they want players to have the freedom to build and create within their own communities. But we can't forget about the other side of the coin. 
Because Nightingale is a PvE-focused survival game, estates are also defensive outposts that give you protection from the AI enemies that would look to kill you in each of the various realms. Strangely enough, you don't even need to build your own estate, if you're lucky enough to run across a pre-existing structure in the realm. Remember, these worlds were being explored before that cataclysmic event. We're not talking about decrepit alien planets never before seen by humankind, so it's very possible you could run across entire structures that you can cohort and take advantage of. I asked the devs to talk a bit more about defensive buildings, to which they said, you saw a bit of this in the announcement trailer, but players are also able to build defensive structures to create strategic combat opportunities in a range of circumstances. Perhaps you have to defend a village from a bound attack, or you want to get a tactical advantage on an apex creature. Savvy Realm Walkers will find a number of ways to use the environment and the building tools to their advantage, and as you progress, you'll be able to unlock new blueprints for items that give you more firepower on your structures. On the crafting front, I think there's a lot of room for flexibility and new ideas. The whole concept of a gas lamp fantasy gives the team a lot of room to create, and the Victorian theme is one you don't see too often in games, so expect something a bit different than you're used to. One example we know to be in the game is a sewing machine, used to create new Victorian-themed garb. Again, don't forget the theme. Nightingale isn't the type of game that will let players run around in chainmail, but how those bowler hats and smoking jackets tie into gameplay, well, that's something I was curious about myself. According to the developers, it's really important to us that players are able to really embody the fantasy of Nightingale's world. Part of that is ensuring that players are able to customize the look of their character and feel distinctive when interacting with the world and with other players. This comes down to finding the resources to be able to craft new clothing and accessories so that you can embody anything from the intrepid, world-weary explorer to an upmarket dandy. We will make sure that players are able to wear what they want to wear without having to be concerned with how it impacts their character attributes. We want players to enjoy the fashion. In a similar vein, I want to talk about weapons. Throughout most of the 1800s, black powder weapons were still the predominant choice for combat, but I think the team is taking some liberty stepping outside the constraints of the time period in favor of weapons that make more sense from a gameplay perspective. Revolvers, bolt-action rifles, and shotguns have all been featured, but we can't forget about fey magic. It's something that should always be in the back of your mind because it gives the developers an avenue to step outside of reality and create something that subverts expectations. I asked the team if they could talk about magic a bit and if it'll come into the combat picture at all, to which they replied, Magic plays an essential role in the world of Nightingale and something we'll explore in more depth at a point in the future. But it is something that exists throughout the realms and will be something that players will not only encounter, but will become possible for them to wield, including being able to imbue weapons with magical properties. Nightingale is a new experience from a new studio in a new world. I'm excited to share that the team's plan is to launch Nightingale into early access before the end of 2022. I know a lot of folks have been wondering about a console release, but for now, the team is focused on nailing the core gameplay loop first for PC and will reevaluate if they can bring the title to console in the future. As far as an early access roadmap, here's what the Nightingale team had to say. The plan is to go into early access later this year. We haven't announced a date yet. Early access launches with what we're calling Season 1. Each season of Nightingale will expand what came before in both terms of furthering the story as Realm Walkers continue to seek out Nightingale City and in terms of content, including new environments, items, NPCs, and other features. Season 1 will be the beginning of the journey, but will contain dozens of hours of content for players to explore. We also learned that the early access period will last as long as needed to get the game just right for its official launch somewhere down the line. I want to remind you all that nothing is completely locked in, and if the community feels that something like PvP is worth exploring, the team is open to those ideas. That's kind of the point of early access. At the end of the day, everyone on the 100-person Inflexion team is just excited to introduce players to a brand new fantasy survival adventure. To say we're excited about Nightingale would be a bit of an understatement. I can't speak for Livid, but the itch to play a solid first-person survival game has never been more persistent. Nightingale offers something uniquely different in the space, a shared world co-op adventure with RPG elements, and that's just not something we've had the pleasure of experiencing. Of course, there are no guarantees, but with an interesting backdrop to build a world upon and a dedicated team led by an industry vet with a proven track record, it's pretty clear that Nightingale is a game worth keeping an eye on. I want to thank the Inflexian team for working with us to put together this Ultimate Preview. It truly was an awesome collaborative process, and if you guys want more Ultimate Previews in your feed, all you need to do is hit that thumbs up and consider subscribing. We've already reached out to a number of other studios to get the ball rolling on future projects, and we'd love to have you along for the ride. 
If you're excited about Nightingale and looking for a community to connect with on day one, consider joining Legacy Gaming on Discord. We've got a great community of over 20,000 members with a section dedicated just for Nightingale, so check out the link below and join up today. Finally, if you like this series and everything we're doing here on the channel and you want to support us even more, consider becoming a member. For just a few bucks, you're helping Liv and I achieve our dreams of becoming full-time content creators. Check out that join button below to learn more. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.